All right, welcome back to the Fist News Studio for another edition of your Week in Review. A ton to cover this week, folks. We're going to start off with a story that Fitz News has covered extensively over the years, the Bowen Turner saga, an accused teen rapist who cannot, cannot keep his nose clean. We're going to walk you through the very latest on his saga and what it means for the cause of judicial reform here in the Palmetto State. We're going to also update you on a major breaking story out of Charleston, South Carolina, one that has national repercussions. I'm referring, of course, to the death of Boeing whistleblower John Barnett, an alleged suicide, but one that comes at a very critical time in a multi-pronged investigation into the crony capitalist aerospace giant, which by the way, this media outlet has consistently called out over the years, unlike those in the mainstream press. We're gonna bring you the very latest on the criminal side of that, as well as the broader Boeing scandal. Last but not least, we're going to dive into a court case that has thrown the entire state for a loop. I'm referring, of course, to the case of Justin Turner, a five-year-old boy found dead in 1989. There was an arrest made earlier this year in this 35-year-old cold case, but we are starting to see that theory of the crime unravel. Our Andy Fancher has all the details on where this investigation could be headed. All of that and more coming your way on The Week in Review. So in our first segment this week, we're going to start off with a story that this media outlet started covering several years ago. It's the case of a fortunate son out of Orangeburg, South Carolina, by the name of Bowen Turner. Now, if that name's familiar to those of you who follow this media outlet, you will recall he was the accused teen rapist whose sweetheart deal from the South Carolina justice system prompted calls for reform of our state's badly broken system. In fact, more than perhaps any other case, Bowen Turner's saga is what opened a lot of people's eyes to the rampant injustice in South Carolina's judicial system, and particularly the corrosive, abhorrent, unfair influence exerted by powerful lawyer legislators. Now, Bowen Turner, for those of you who don't know, is a teenager who was accused of not one, not two, but three sexual assaults against young women in three different counties during a period of a little over a year and a half back in 2018 and 2019. Now, there were a lot of commonalities in these assaults, uh, and Bowen Turner was perceived by many to be in line for significant, significant jail time. But thanks to retired Circuit Court Judge Mark Lee Dennis, an inept prosecution team led by Second Circuit Solicitor Bill Weeks, and another confluence of legislative influence, what we ended up with was Bowen Turner pleading guilty to one charge, and not for sexual assault, one assault charge, for which he received no jail time. In fact, he received five years probation. Now, this case sparked outrage amongst victims' advocates, amongst many other prosecutors, and amongst those who are pushing for judicial reform, because what they saw was a young man represented by powerful Senate Minority Leader Brad Hutto. Now, this is an individual who previously claimed to be the best friend to women in the South Carolina General Assembly. Well, he wasn't a friend to Chloe Bess, one of Bowen Turner's three victims. In fact, he slut-shamed her in open court, which was the first time we started covering this story over four years ago. But as this story began to unfold, what we saw in the court process was the influence that Hutto was able to exert over the system to get his, his client not only charitable bond conditions, which, by the way, Bowen Turner violated on more than 50 occasions, but also a sentence that was totally out of line with the crimes he stood accused of. Now, in following that story, we produced a number of different articles, a documentary even. We interviewed family members of Turner's victims, but there was one person we couldn't interview. There's one person whose perspective we weren't able to bring to you, and that was the perspective of Dallas Stoller, one of the women assaulted by Bowen Turner. And the reason we couldn't bring you Dallas's perspective is that in November of 2021, in the aftermath of a 
campaign of what appeared to be organized bullying emanating from allies of Bowen Turner out of Orangeburg, Dallas took her own life. And unfortunately, that made it even more difficult for the state to impose any sort of accountability on Bowen Turner, not that they were trying very hard from the looks of it. But as this case unfolded, again, we called this system out. We called out Judge Dennis. We called out Prosecutor Bill Weeks. Tried to hold all of them accountable. But Bowen Turner was, was set free. However, it didn't take long. It didn't take long for him to once again show who he really is. On Mother's Day in 2022 in Orangeburg, he was attempting to, to lure another woman, another woman from a bar in Orangeburg. Fortunately, this woman was able to get away from Bowen Turner, who was eventually arrested for public drunkenness. He was later accused of threatening a public official when he tried to bite, allegedly, a finger of a correctional boy. But finally, in the aftermath of that incident, Bowen Turner was finally subjected to some accountability. And he spent approximately 16 months at the South Carolina Department of Corrections after his probation was rightfully revoked in that case. Now, this is an example of what should happen, folks. When violent criminals break the conditions of their probation, let's forget for the moment whether or not we felt that probation was appropriate or not, but when they do break it, they should absolutely be thrown in jail. And that is what happened eventually to Bowen Turner after his Mother's Day 2022 fiasco. But when Bowen Turner was released from prison, guess what, folks? Once again, it didn't take long. In Florence County, this month, Bowen Turner was involved in a driving under the influence accident. In the aftermath of this latest incident, Turner has been charged with driving under the influence, open container, resisting arrest, disorderly conduct, once again, showing us exactly who he is. He allegedly threatened again public officials seeking to bring him into the detention center there in Florence. Here's the question. And uh, by the way, of course, he was granted a very lenient bond once again and is back out, even though this happened while he is still in the window of that recently revoked probation. We talk about this often here on this media outlet, folks. When people show you who they are, believe them. And I'm not saying people don't deserve second chances. That clearly is not what this story is about. Because this is a young man, again, only 21 years old right now, who's been given chance after chance after chance. He managed to avoid prison. He managed to avoid being placed on a sex offender registry. All because he had those powerful connections who were watching out for him. Again, at the expense of public safety and at the expense of justice for multiple victims. But this case isn't happening in a vacuum. I've debated a number of folks in the South Carolina General Assembly who say, oh, well, you can cherry pick a case here or focus on one case there. No. We have presented at this media outlet dozens of cases like this one where, again, Influence from those who pick our judges dictate an unjust outcome. Now, before we break from the Bowen Turner saga, the latest chapter, before I go off and talk about Casey Lee Combs, the violent criminal who just the other day on this show we talked about, who had assaulted multiple women, again, very similar circumstances, yet was let out by Circuit Court Judge Bentley Price and reoffended promptly, then got another sweetheart deal, and then once again reoffended, pulled a gun on a woman's head, clocked a man in the face, multiple stitches in this gentleman's mouth, all because this guy who should have been locked up years ago over and over again allowed to go free. Bowen Turner should have been locked up years ago over and over again. He's allowed to go free. But the effort to fix that system, we were told, experienced a victory this past week. The South Carolina Senate has passed a judicial reform bill. Now, did it remove powerful lawyer legislators like Brad Hutto, like Todd Rutherford, 
who have habitually exploited their influence over the judiciary? Did it remove lawyer legislators from, from the panel that picks judges here in South Carolina? No. Did it take the ability to vote on these judges away from lawmakers? No. Lawmakers still screen the judges they want. They still vote on the judges they want. There were a few tweaks, a few minor adjustments to the current process. They now at least have to do it in the open, in public, on camera, live stream. That's some progress, I guess. But I fear we are missing a significant opportunity right now at a time when public attention like never before, has been focused on these cases. And not just these cases, folks, but the reason these cases keep happening, the reason that we have to be a broken record on this issue. There is finally widespread awareness of the problem, and yet lawmakers, the ones who wield this power, are refusing to take advantage of this opportunity to fix a system that clearly is not serving the public, that clearly is not delivering justice for victims, and that clearly is continuing to turn violent offenders like Bowen Turner back out on the streets where your kids, my kids, and all of us are at risk. You can count on this media outlet not only to expose those stories, but to continue the push for real reform of South Carolina's badly broken judicial branch not the tinkering around the edges that state lawmakers seem content to enact in an effort to pretend they've done something about the problem. Again, that's not worthy of our state. That's not worthy of the people like the victims of Bowen Turner and the victims of all the cases we cover. It's not worthy of you. We can do better. We must demand better and count on this media outlet to insist on better. So as last week's edition of the Week in Review was going to air, down in Charleston, South Carolina, the third day of a deposition involving a Boeing whistleblower was underway. And the name of the whistleblower, 62-year-old John Barnett. Originally of Pineville, Louisiana, Barnett spent 28 years at Boeing's primary manufacturing facility up in Everett, Washington. But in 2010, he was moved to the Palmetto State when Boeing opened a gleaming new, heavily subsidized facility in North Charleston. Now the 787 Dreamliners are the planes that are made in the Palmetto State. Nikki Haley, of course, referred to them as Mac Daddy planes, if you remember, but the 787 has had a very troubled history. In fact, it was grounded shortly after the planes were unveiled, and there have been repeated allegations of workmanship issues and production problems at the North Charleston facility. Well, John Barnett was at the Boeing plant in South Carolina for seven years and retired from the company in 2017. Again, that's 35 years of service to Boeing. Now, not long after he left, Barnett began sounding the alarm about many of these production problems and alleged defects in Boeing's processes. And according to him, a lot of it stemmed from the culture of this company, which apparently values speed and profits in production over the safety of the public. Now, certainly, we all understand companies have to make a profit. That's why they're in business. But Boeing is a company that relies heavily on not only federal subsidies for defense and other contracts, but relies on taxpayer-funded incentives. In fact, a billion dollars from South Carolina taxpayers to locate in North Charleston back in 2009. But in an industry as critical to our national security as air travel is essential in terms of public safety, transporting hundreds of people every day in these metal tubes traveling 600 miles an hour, clearly a higher standard needs to be met. And Boeing, according to Barnett, had habitually failed to meet that standard. Now, we don't know everything that this deposition focused on, but what we do know is that Barnett had been outspoken about issues in Charleston, specifically saying he would never fly on a 787 built in the Palmetto State. In fact, right around the time he was making these claims, numerous airwaves were returning 787s, claiming they would not accept delivery of these planes if they were made in South Carolina. 
But it wasn't the 787's problems that thrust Barnett back into the national limelight. It was issues involving the 737 MAX, another troubled jet manufactured by this crony capitalist aerospace giant. Now, if you remember back in 2019, there were two fatal accidents involving the 737 MAX in which planes crashed, pilots apparently unaware of what was happening, automatic controls overrode their attempts to steady these aircrafts, and they literally fell from the sky. 346 people died in those two accidents, and the 737 MAX was grounded. Now, the planes eventually came back into the sky. They were allowed by the FAA to fly again, but there were questions raised at the time. And Boeing particularly entered a settlement with the U.S. Department of Justice, paying a massive $2.5 billion. Some of that went to the airlines that were impacted. $500 million of it, I believe, went to the victims. The feds, of course, got their quarter of a billion cut. But this huge settlement basically obligated Boeing to any number of safety protocols and accountability and transparency when it came to how this plane was being built, how this plane's manufacturing processes were being conducted. But Barnett was continuing to sound the alarm that Boeing hadn't learned that this culture of, of speed versus safety was continuing to permeate, continuing to drive the production of the 737 MAX. And everything came to a head back on January 5 of this year. That's when an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 experienced a panel failure in which part of the plane's fuselage literally blew out. Now, 177 people were on board the jet at the time of this incident. Thankfully, no one was killed. The plane was able to make an emergency landing in Portland, Oregon. But the manufacturing defects that Barnett had warned about and the culture that he had warned about were once again back under the microscope. And more importantly for Boeing, the promises the company made after those two fatal crashes that resulted in the plane's grounding, that was back under the microscope in a big way. So in January, a lot of wheels were set in motion and they were coming to a head at the time that Barnett was appearing for his deposition. In fact, right on that same day, FAA announced it had determined multiple problems with Boeing's production process. 96 different processes they tested, almost two thirds of them the company failed. At the same time, Justice announced that it was investigating the Alaska air crash to find out whether or not the agreement Boeing made back when it was able to avoid prosecution in connection with the fatal crashes, they were going to find out whether or not Boeing was following through on its promises. Where's all this going? I'll tell you where it's going. John Barnett's body was found outside his hotel room last Saturday morning. Handgun in his hand, his finger still on the trigger, bullet wound to his temple, a note allegedly in the vehicle. This is an open investigation. It has been deemed a parent suicide by the Charleston County Coroner and Charleston Police Department. That's their initial take. But prior to his death, Barnett actually told several of his close friends, if you read about a suicide, don't believe it. In fact, one of those friends gave an interview with a local television station down in Charleston specifically saying, don't believe it, that he had said, if you hear, hear reports that I've committed suicide, it's not true. While all this is going on, the head of the National Transportation Safety Board this week sent a letter to members of the U.S. Senate letting them know that Boeing had, quote, overwrote the security footage on this jet that almost fell out of the sky back in January. That's right. They can't find the footage that shows the work performed on this plane. Meanwhile, the crew manager of the shift that performed that work has apparently been unavailable to testify to the agency and to senators because he has a medical issue. And Boeing, again, after being personally called, the CEO of the company, 
personally called by the head of the NTSB, said, oh, we have no records for any of the work that was done on this plane. Does anyone see where this is going? Does anyone see where this story has been? Now, I can't speak for other media outlets in South Carolina. There were a lot of cheerleaders when Boeing came to the Palmetto State. There were a lot of folks who talked about all the thousands of jobs that would be created. And they've created jobs, not as many as they claimed. They've laid off a lot of people. But Boeing has created jobs in the Palmetto State. Were they worth the billion dollars that were shelled out? Could that money have done far greater good had it been given to small businesses throughout the state? But I'll tell you one thing, this media outlet never cheerleaded Boeing. In fact, we reported on all of these production issues. In fact, we cited John Baronet's work on multiple occasions calling Boeing out. Again, I am glad that this has finally sparked a debate over this corporate citizen. And I'm glad that media outlets like Channel 4 down in Charleston are holding Boeing's feet to the fire at long last. But it's something we should have been doing all along. It's something this media outlet was doing all along. I'd encourage you to go back, read our coverage over the last few years of Boeing. We've got links to it in all of our recent stories about this tragedy involving John Barnett. Check those stories out. See who was holding this company accountable while all the other outlets were cheerleading the billion-dollar subsidy that came out of your pockets. A big chunk of that, by the way, approved by former Governor Nikki Haley, who was then rewarded with a seat on Boeing's board. Again, you've heard of too big to fail? Well, Boeing's apparently too big to be convicted, too big to be held accountable. Were they big enough to murder? We're going to have to see where this investigation goes, but count on this media outlet, not only to keep holding the crony capitalist system accountable, but to dig into the alleged suicide of John Barnett to get to the bottom of it and to bring you the truth about what happened to this Boeing whistleblower. Earlier this year, our media outlet did an unsolved Carolinas report on the 1989 death of five-year-old Justin Turner. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Unsolved, it's a series sponsored by our friends at Bamberg Legal that goes into cases in North and South Carolina that haven't been solved, that are still seeking resolution and outcome for family members and for victims. But in this particular case, an arrest was made earlier this year involving the death of Justin Turner. But as our Andy Fancher reports, this week in Berkeley County, that narrative was called into question. Here's an explosive report from Andy Fancher on the latest developments in the unsolved murder of five-year-old Justin Turner. And you didn't know anything about the serial killer at the time you were investigating? No. Pretty explosive evidence. That's how Deputy Solicitor Ann Williams reacted to evidence presented by defense attorney Sean Kent during his motion to dismiss the state's case against 63-year-old Megan Turner and 69-year-old Victor Turner. On January 9th, 2024, the Turners were charged in connection with the cold case murder of their only child, whose half-naked body was located by Victor two days after calling investigators in 1989. Victor's wife was thereafter charged in the rape and murder of her five-year-old stepson only for the Ninth Circuit Solicitor's Office to dismiss the case within months due to insufficient evidence. So the investigation at that time determined that Pamela Turner had deviated from her normal routine that morning. Come 35 years after Justin Turner was found asphyxiated on his parents' property, Berkeley County Sheriff's Office Detective John Plitch arrested the couple following a, quote, new look at old evidence. What old evidence? Polyester fiber retrieved from a dog leash three decades later, leading investigators to believe that Megan and Victor had inverted a dog collar and thereafter used it to murder their son. A theory not only confusing the defense, but circuit court judge Roger Young. But, it would, but the collar itself, they don't have. They just bought a collar from they just Walmart. Bought a collar 35 years later. 
35 years later, 31 years later. The dog collar theory was furthermore contested during cross-examination when Kent played a recorded call between Plitch and a forensic expert hired by the sheriff's office to explore his theory. How, uh, how wedded are you to this leash? Because I don't think it's that leash. One of the problems with this is um, you get to a certain point where you're, you're, you're almost making, you know, castles out of clouds and stuff. Kent furthermore revealed in court an email between the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division and Solicitor Williams in which a forensic analyst wrote this about Plitch. My recollection is that after explaining that Pamela Turner was excluded as a contributor to a profile, Detective Plish said something to the effect of, how can we still make this fit? According to Plitch, Justin Turner died by strangulation either during or after a sexual assault and noted the absence of semen or secretion on or near the five-year-old's body. Plitch furthermore maintained that Justin was either placed or staged at the crime scene following his disappearance and that investigators noted an unknown car within the area following his murder. I've been on this case since, I don't know, like an hour and a half ago and I found it. <coughs> Y'all had it for 35 years and you don't know anything about it. According to Kent, citing research from the University of Virginia's Innocence Project, a serial killer had landed at the Charleston Naval Shipyard on March 3rd, 1989, the very day that Justin went missing. And despite dying without a criminal record, the Columbia native and Irmo High School graduate has since been linked to multiple abductions, rapes, and murders of multiple children across the eastern seaboard. The serial killer had erectile dysfunction until 2000 when he got prescribed, when he got a prescription for Viagra. His crimes before that time do not involve semen or seminal fluid. In 1987, the serial killer had a toolbox that contained his kit, duct tape, handcuffs, vibrator. A Navy buddy of his saw the box with the serial killer's name on it. On the ship, the serial killer was assigned to before and until May of 1989. After an abducted child escaped his Richland County apartment in June, redacted, Richard Mark Avonitz called his sister and confessed to, quote, committing more crimes than he could remember. What I do appreciate, believe it or not, is I think the officer was brutally honest on the stand. And so sometimes I appreciate that if you're gonna get on the stand, just tell the truth, which he did. And he acknowledged the problems with their cases. He didn't try to say there were, and y'all heard it, he didn't try to say there was new evidence. He was very clear there's the same old evidence looked at in a different way. So yeah, I harbor some resentment, um, but not as much as I could. After recording this story, attorney Sean Kent revealed that Berkeley County Sheriff's Office investigators not only knew about Richard Avonitz, but that the FBI had instructed them to, quote, review all unsolved abductions, sexual assaults, and or murders that occurred the time frame Avonitz is documented to have been in your jurisdiction. This message from the FBI sent 16 years before Thursday's motion to dismiss the state's case against Megan and Victor Turner. For FitzNews.com, I'm Andrew Fancher. Obviously just an unbelievable case. Can't wait to see where it's going. Counting on Andy Fancher to keep all of us in the loop on the very latest developments in the unsolved murder of Justin Turner. All right, that's a wrap for this week's edition of Your Week in Review. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Obviously very excited to see how these stories unfold and count on us to continue to keep tabs on these stories as they move forward. But I'm also very excited about something we're going to be doing on March the 29th. That's right, the last show of the month. We're going to do a month in review. And not only that, we're going to do it live. And not only that, we're going to take your questions about the stories you want us to cover. So be on the lookout in the next few days for more information about the Fitz News Live Month in Review coming on March 29th. We'll check you then, and thanks again for watching The Week in Review.